Well, it's 10 o'clock, so I think we'll get started. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Healing Community Study Learning Collaborative. My name is Lisa Romley, and I'm the Education Program Coordinator for the HEAL Study. We are here today to discuss the impact of stigma on families experiencing substance use disorder and learn some stigma reduction interventions. I just need to review some housekeeping items um, before we get started. Just a reminder that this session is being recorded. And if your screen name is not your full name, you're using a partial name or you're using your phone, if you could please update that now and change it to your full name, this helps when we compare the participants list to the registration list. We are offering CE credits for today's session. One CE credit has been approved for physicians, pharmacists, nurses, social workers, and licensed alcohol and drug counselors. And I will give you instructions on how to obtain that CE credit at the end of today's session. We also offer certificates of attendance for anyone that wants that. We do ask that you stay on mute during the session if you're not speaking, and that just helps reduce echoes and extraneous noises. And if you have questions for today's session, we do welcome your questions. Please use either the raise hand feature, which is you can find if you click on reaction and then click on the raised hand, or you can type your uh, questions in the chat box and we'll read that sometime during the session. Just to announce that for, um, for today's session, all presenters have stated that they do not have any relevant financial relationships to disclose. The practice gaps that we have identified is language can be used intentionally or unintentionally to perpetuate stigma in the healthcare setting. Changing our language is a crucial component of reducing stigma to improve the lives and health of people experiencing substance use disorder. The educational needs that will be addressed is understanding that words matter and stigma-free language can promote efforts to treatment and recovery. The learning objects of, objectives for today's session is discussing the impact of stigma on families experiencing substance use disorder, identifying language that can perpetuate stigma, and discussing stigma reduction intervention. And at the end of today's session, will uh, identify the roles of language in perpetuating substance use disorders, stigma, and steps to ensure our language is positive, productive, and inclusive. For today's learning collaborative, we have Dr. Michelle Statton, who will be moderating the session. Dr. Statton is a professor in the Department of Behavioral Science and a faculty associate at the UK Center on Drug and Alcohol Research. She is a faculty member on the Healing Community Study Team. Educated as a social worker, Dr. Statton's research focuses primarily on justice-involved individuals with substance use disorders. I will now turn it over to her to introduce our speakers. Well, good morning, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, perfect, great. Well, it's really a pleasure to be here with you today to participate in this important learning collaborative I'm a firm believer you don't have to be a practitioner in a substance use treatment disorder agency to see the challenges that individuals and families face in this area. And I think social workers are uniquely positioned across a number of different practice arenas to assess and intervene with individuals and families struggling with substance use disorder. So we have an all-star cast of social workers with us here today from a variety of these different practice arenas. And I would actually like to ask each of them to introduce themselves, to talk about your role within your agency, how long you've been working in the substance use field, and overview your agency's goals towards addressing substance use disorder. So I will call on each of the panelists and ask them to speak to that directly. So Sarah Johnson, can you please lead us off? Absolutely. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for allowing me to be here today. Um, my name is Sarah Johnson, and I'm the Director of Addiction Services for the Department of Corrections. So I've been in that role for about four and a half years, and the uh, 
I'm sorry, the um, Division of Addiction Services oversees all of the substance use disorder treatment that is provided in our prisons, in our jails, and to individuals that are under some form of supervision through probation and parole. Um, as far as our agency goals, we believe in evidence-based treatment and following best practice in the substance use disorder field when it comes to implementing treatment and supporting multiple pathways towards recovery. Mm. Um, a little bit about my background. Mm. Um, I have spent about 16 years working in the criminal justice mm. system with individuals that have substance use disorder and or mental health conditions. Um, I'm a social worker by training, uh, both in undergraduate and my master's degree. And I'm licensed as a certified social worker and a licensed clinical alcohol and alcohol drug counselor. So that's a little bit about me. Great, thank you, Sarah. And uh, Kay Fetter will come to you next, but I also would like to remind everyone, if you aren't speaking, please put your microphones on mute. Uh, Kay, please. Hello, my name is Kate Fetter, and I'm the Targeted Assessment Specialist for the University of Kentucky Targeted Assessment Program Opioid Use Disorder Project. My office is based in Winchester, Kentucky, and I've been with UK TAP OUD for a little over two years now. Um, the Targeted Assessment Program Opioid Use Disorder Project was developed through a contract with Kentucky Cabinet Health and Family Services and the University of Kentucky Center on drug and alcohol research. The objective of TAP OUD is to identify and address multiple barriers to family self-sufficiency and safety with an emphasis on parents at risk for opioid use disorders. Among Department for Community-Based Services participants, the TAP OUD assessors are trained and experienced in the targeted areas of substance use, mental health, intimate partner, violence, victimization, learning problems, and parental protective factors. So we assess for all those. Um, the assessors were located on site at the DCBS offices um, and protection and permanency. We conduct assessments, pre-treatment, and service coordination focused on identifying and addressing substance use, mental health, intimate partner violence, victimization, learning problems, and with a special emphasis on engaging participants with opioid use disorders and appropriate treatment to include medication for opioid use disorders. Once engaged in treatment, the TAP OUD assessors assist participants to complete treatment and develop strategies for long-term recovery. Great, thank you very much. Uh, we'll go now to Sarah Bryant. Hi, my name is Sarah Bryant. I'm with DCBS and supervise um, the sobriety treatment and recovery team in Fayette County. Many people may have heard of us as START. Um, I have been working in substance use just under 10 years, but in the field for about 15. I have a master's in social work from Eastern Kentucky University. Um, in looking at, I was looking at DCBS's I Googled DCBS, Kentucky, and then uh, substance use goals, and START came up. So I'm going to say that START is the goal of DCBS um, related to substance use. And so some of those goals are we want to ensure child safety. That's the number one goal. But we also want to do that with the second piece is to prevent children from coming in out-of-home care. So START really works to um, provide intensive services to families to ensure that they can stay together, getting parents into services for substance use disorder, while also ensuring child safety. Um, we want to increase parental recovery and the recovery capital, increase the parental capacity and, and stability within that family, reduce repeat maltreatment, um, and really improve the system. And so that's kind of where we, you know, we want to spread our some of our practices that can be applied to other cases throughout the system to create less children in out-home care um, and more family stability and parental recovery. So thank you. Great. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, Ty Ugenbecken. Hi, my name is Ty Ugenbecken. Um, uh, I work for Voices of Hope. I'm a program coordinator here on the Healing Community Study. Um, my 
our goal, our overall goal here with Voices of Hope is we support people who use drugs or alcohol or are seeking a better life. And so we do that through many programs, such as our Pregnancy Empowerment Pro Project, uh, harm reduction, um, just any way we can build recovery capital through um, helping someone sustain a better life. Great, thank you. Uh, Amy Preston. Hi, I'm Amy Preston. I'm a licensed clinical social worker with the University of Kentucky's SMART Clinic. SMART, um, it's gonna be a mouthful <laughs> for you all, but we are the support, um, we're the support of mental health and addiction recovery treatment, um, ambulatory clinic that's part of the university. Uh, and we have several sister programs that are with the university. We, the program that I serve, um, I serve a sub program within the SMART Clinic. It is the program for parenting women. Um, we were formerly known as the university's Beyond Birth Comprehensive Care Center. So um, if you, you might've heard of us by her prior name, I um, have been a social worker for more than 20 years. Um, throughout, the, throughout the course of my time that has been spent almost primarily with um, individuals in substance use um, or recovering from it. Our clinic, um, we, we seek to treat addiction, um, dependency, recovery through a biopsychosocial um, framework. So we want to globally treat the individual um, in all of aspects of how um, substance use may affect their lives. Um, our program in particular, serves women, parenting women, women attempting to reunify with their children. Um, most of our women are gonna be of childbearing age. Our, and our goal is to keep them with their children. Um, we wanna be, be a safe place for our women and their children. We wanna address stigma. We want children to see that their mothers recover, um, that this is a prevalent chronic disorder um, that's treatable and that they are not alone. Um, and we hope that our women come to us in fellowship and that we are a place where um, generational patterns of trauma or generational trauma, generational um, feelings of shame, guilt, um, stigma die with us. We want to, when we, um, we have the ability at the SMART Clinic and all the participants we see, um, they are able to stay with us as long as they would like to do that. So we don't discharge within two years, four years. Some of the women that we provide care for, um, having come from our sister program, or I guess it's our mother program now, UK Pathways, they have been with um, the university now, many of them nearing seven years. And so glad to be here today. Thank you all. Great, thank you very much. And last, but certainly not least, uh, Julie Bowers Pryor. Good morning. I'm really glad to get to be here with everyone today. I am Julie Bowers Fryer. Most of you know me as Jules. Uh, I am actually dual licensed as a clinical social worker as well as a clinical alcohol drug counselor. I've been in the substance dependence treatment field for close to 20 years now, which feels like it's flown by, which is awesome. Um, I'm currently working as the principal social worker with the Pathways program, which is the the mother program that Amy was referring to, so we get to um, collaborate closely with um, clients as they transition. So the Pathways program, what we do specifically is we're working with um, pregnant women who have uh, substance use disorders. And what we do is we package together their prenatal care because we want to make sure that they have healthy fetal outcomes. Um, while we're doing that, we're trying to also engage them in recovery. We'll have some moms come to us who already are in recovery, and we're just going to support their ongoing journey. Um, we also have some moms come to us who are still contemplating if recovery is an option they want to pursue. Uh, we embrace them wherever they are in that continuum. And we work to help move them towards whatever goals they establish. Um, we work with all substance use disorders, but we have mostly um, historically addressed disorders with opioids. We do offer medication management to help with that for those who seek that. And we've also been able to extend uh, our care and services up to a year postpartum now. 
So once they reach that one year postpartum, we help assist them with transitioning to whatever program they feel is appropriate for ongoing care. A lot of times uh, we'll, we'll go ahead and partner with uh, programs like SMART, uh, since we already have that established relationship. Our goal more than anything is to help these moms have healthy fetal outcomes, engaging in recovery, and hopefully helping them be able to establish not only connections with their children, but also being able to establish the opportunity to no longer have ongoing generational issues with substance use. We're really hoping that by intervening now, we're able to change the trajectory of not just the individual, but of the family. Great, thank you so much. So I told you, you had an all-star cast. There's a tremendous amount of experience on this panel today, but I'm glancing over the participant list and I know there's a tremendous amount of experience in this room today as well. So we are gonna use a round table format where there are some very targeted questions to the panelists, but we also, as Lisa opened the discussion today, we do wanna encourage you to use the chat and post questions and participate in the discussion as well. So I'm gonna go ahead and lead us off with our first question, which is how has your belief or view of substance use disorders changed over time? And I'm gonna ask this question, uh, maybe Sarah Johnson, if you could lead us off and then move to Amy and then to Ty. Absolutely. Um, so that was, when I saw that question, I thought, oh, wow, looking back, if I only knew now or then what I know now, um, the easy answer to this is just simply I had the definition wrong. I didn't fully understand what addiction and recovery was. Um, we all come to the table with our life's experience, our family history, the things that we, how we view the world. And those unconscious biases, I was not aware of. Um, so I really, starting out, saw substance use disorder, first of all, as treatment has to be abstinent. Like that is the only way that you are truly in recovery is a period of sobriety. Um, but I didn't understand, like, why can't people just stop? Like they're having these negative consequences. Why don't you just stop? And it goes back to simply not fully understanding what substance use disorder and addiction is. And I cannot define it any better than ASAM, but I love the way that ASAM has defined it. Um, you know, it, it's treatable, it's chronic, it's complex, it, it involves the brain, um, the behaviors, the compulsion. So over the years through my experience, I finally was able to fully appreciate and understand what addiction truly is and then what recovery looks like. And, you know, recovery isn't necessarily being um, abstinence from substance. It's a process of changing your overall well-being, your health, um, reaching your full potential. So by understanding that it's a chronic disease and understanding that the goal is to control or reduce symptoms, it helps me have a better appreciation of what it is that I'm there to help a client do um, to work towards their recovery. Um, it's it's about improvement in overall well-being and helping individuals increase their recovery, recovery capital so that they can reach their full potential. Great. Thank you, Amy. Hi. So as I touched on a little bit before, it, it would be easier for me to start off in telling you what, I, what my view is now. Um, having worked um, my entire life in in um, in substance with with patients in substance use disorder with in patients in different stages of their substance use disorder and recovery. So again, for me, the way I understand it today, the way that we support um, our patients at our clinic is that this um, substance use disorder is a prevalent, chronic, complex. Um, medical disorder, it's a disease of the brain that is treatable. We also um, understand that it is a complex disorder in that it's just not medical, but that it affects um, individuals on a bio um, psychosocial framework level. So um, there's this complexity of treating patients medically and have biology, behavior, 
um, and in the environment all kind of interact with one another um, and certain stressors affect patients' ability to heal, recover fully, um, that need to be addressed. We know that this is going to be a lifetime disorder. This is not something that can be cured or fixed, um, that this is something that we're gonna have to work on for the rest of our life. When I began, when I was a baby social worker, this is like way, this is a long time ago. Um, I started my career on the front lines of child protective services. I served um, in the field for 17 years before I left. When I was very young and new to the scene, the, the way that substance use disorders were defined then um, and what we thought about treatment is so completely different than now than it was then. I remember, um, and I can't remember exactly what I might've co-signed or what I might've been part of all those years ago. I feel like it's been so long ago and that my growth has always continued as I've served people. Um, but I remember we would talk about things such as, why can't someone just stop? Why can't, why don't they wanna be with their children? They must not care for their children if they're continuing to use, um, that there was only one way to treatment and this is how it looked that recovery couldn't differ from this path, that um, medication-assisted treatment was essentially, tra was essentially trading one substance for another, um, almost as if um, our MAT clinics were legally bartering substances for money. Um, and there was kind of what I would call like old school um, theories about how recovery had to look. Mostly it was going to be in residential facilities. You were going to be there long term. I remember, you know, many, many years ago that we would have women um, that I served in child protective services that would go somewhere like say the Chrysalis House. They would be there, they would be there close to 18 months, um, which if you've ever um, worked a case with child reunification and follow um, the federal guidelines that say how much time that we afford a family um, to reunify before alternative permanency decisions are made. That we've already we've already passed that time frame by our, the time our women would have been able to be reunified with their children. So it is drastically different. <laughs> My view is drastically di different now in understanding that this is not this is not a character flaw. This is not willpower. This is not about someone's moral compass or who they are as innately as a person. Um, this is about a disease of the mind, of the brain that is complex, that we're still learning things about all the time. Um, and that isn't um, all these things that I know it to have been 20 years ago. Great, thank you. Ty? So I think what I bring different to the table today is that I have lived experience with opioid use disorder. Um, my view over time has drastically changed. It's drastically changed from when I started working at Voices of Hope to now. Um, in the beginning, when I uh, first started uh, down my path to recovery about 10 years ago, um, everything was abstinence-based. And that was just not a pathway that I, I could sustain. Um, and now uh, through so many programs uh, that I owe my life to, um, I have found a pathway that works for me. And now so coming up on four years of recovery, um, sustained recovery, I have recovery capital that I can not only stand on my own, but I can stand and share with others. Um, so my view has drastically changed and I am a huge proponent for medications for opioid use disorder. Um, Cause I think that it gives someone the opportunity to not only treat the actual illness, which is opioid use disorder and have that go into remission and then they can work on their recovery. So it gives them this dual platform to work on themselves instead of just trying to do it one way and the only way. Great, thank you very much. So we'll move on to our next question, which is 
What do you see as some of the greatest challenges among social workers in working with clients and families around issues related to substance use disorder? And I'm going to ask Sarah Bryant to lead this discussion, uh, followed by Jules. So when I saw this question, I knew I wanted to answer it because I feel like so prior to working with START, I was a frontline DCBS worker and I saw firsthand siloed. We don't work together a lot of the times. DCBS has its case plan with a the family. Then a the family is working with the criminal justice system who has their own tasks. Then they're working with a provider who has their own treatment plan. And there are all these parallel plans that if they were brought together, they could be one plan that would be much simpler for the family and focused for them. And so when I came to start and saw that that's possible, I was like, wow, we've, you know, we need to get mad. We need to be frustrated that we're not working together and get out of the silo thinking and start working together. Um, you know, our families interact with so many systems. We have mental health, we have, you know, criminal justice, we have medical needs. And if we can all come to the table together and create that plan, um, will work better for the families. They will feel less overwhelmed. Um, we can fill in needs. And I think a lot of it requires understanding each other's role. Like I know I do a lot of education about DCBS and what our roles are and that we're not trying to be punitive, but a lot of times we're focused on child safety and, and recovery. And so we're trying to balance all these different goals. So if we can come together, um, I think a lot of the problems I hear a lot, people saying, well, my clients just got a cookie cutter case plan with the cabinet. And I think if we can kind of pull down some of those silos, we won't have those. We'll have good treatment recommendations that we can put on case plans with DCBS and support that from both sides and then pulling in the courts in that process. Um, so that's, that's one of the biggest challenges. I think figuring out how we can break down these silos, how we can collaborate more effectively together. And I think we'll see better outcomes with families. If you look at a lot of the research around START, you'll see that there are better outcomes when we do break down those silos. And so um, that's a goal is thinking about how we can work better to go together and have more collaboration. Great, thank you. Jules, we'll transition to you. Yeah, I cannot agree with Sarah um, any more of the necessity okay. of co-collaboration okay. because all too often we'll have our clients um, duplicating services, doing things that are far beyond what um, most of us who have relatively stable lives can manage. And so for us to ask that of them uh, really is not reasonable. And we get so buried when we're not collaborating that we don't realize how much we're actually putting on them. Uh, but more focused on the challenges I was thinking through, which is, you know, I think it's the combination of what we place on clients as institutions um, and some of the factors that limit them there, as well as stigma. One of the things that we have to always keep in mind is what is happening in our clients' lives outside of our contact with them. So for a lot of the folks I've worked with historically, they've had legal records. Um, well, if you've been incarcerated, that makes it really difficult to get a job, especially a job with a livable wage. If you are able to successfully get that job, are you able to maintain transportation? Most of our people have transportation challenges because they can't afford a car that works regularly, which then puts their job in jeopardy. Then we have situations where they're having difficulty getting housing that's safe because they can't afford housing that's not in a neighborhood where they're exposed to use. So we can't just think about let's get this person stable from using drugs. We have to think about what are all the pieces that we need to put together as recovery capital to set them up for long-term sustained success. And uh, that sounds great and it's hard. It's really hard to do. And that's why I love that Sarah let out with talking about uh, co-collaboration, because that's where it really is going to happen, is the surrounding of agencies and services working together. The other piece is, is the stigma. When I think about my history of working with moms with the need of medication for opioid use disorder, I can't tell you how many times I've heard from them, from their families, well, I'm not clean if I'm on medication, or I'm not really in recovery. When we know for a fact that it looks very different when somebody is stable on medication and taking it like they're supposed to versus when somebody is in active use. And I really feel like we need to be champions of reframing how people understand medication management and that it is a tool just like any other tool. Some people will stay on it for the continuation of their ongoing recovery. Some people don't and neither one is right or wrong, but we need to make sure that we're not becoming barriers 
um, to people accessing that. Because when I have somebody come to me who says, I know I need this medication, but they're afraid to be on it because of how others view them, the chances of their likelihood of long-term success, it's, it's fragile. It's very fragile. And every person on this panel, and I'm sure many of you that are sitting in this room right now can tell story after story of, of someone who would have who would have made it had they had the opportunity for medication, but they didn't feel it was an opportunity. And unfortunately, um, we've seen too many overdoses because of that. So. So this next question, I think really continues that thread a little bit. And Jules, if it's okay, we'll just stick with you. So can you think of examples that you have seen in practice of language or other practices among social workers or other professionals that help to perpetuate some of that stigma. So you kind of touched on a few of those already and if it's okay, we'll just continue with you and then Sarah Johnson, if you could chime in as well. Sure, I'd be happy to. You know, in addition to what I was just saying, one of the examples that always comes to my mind that I've seen, I've worked for uh, Chrysalis House as well as Narcotics Addiction Program, in addition to where I'm at currently with Pathways and Something that I've seen every organization struggle with that has influenced stigma is understanding uh, DCBS mandatory reporting rules. Uh, they see that, that word that says pattern of use, and I think that they're not able to understand what that means. The example I always think of with this is, we know that there are plenty of people, upper middle class functioning well, who put their kids to bed every night and probably drink too much wine probably would not be able to take their kid to emergency treatment if they needed to. And we don't report that, even though it's happening every night. Um, but yet, if we have a mom who has been in recovery for a year, and she has one slip, and she comes to us and tells us she is a slip, um, I've seen too many agencies jump to reporting when that person's re-engaged in recovery. Um, and what happens in the midst of that is that becomes something where we're telling people it's not okay to work your recovery plan and tell us you need help. And we're stigmatizing what's going on in their lives. And that is going to be something that's going to prevent people from seeking out the level of care that they really need. Uh, I, I want people to be able to come to us and say, if they've had a slip, um, I wanna be able to support them. And you know, I think we need to really think through as, as organizations, um, reporting does need to happen. I mean, don't hear me wrong. There's there's a time where there's a line that yes, it does need to happen, but we need to be mindful of when that point is. Because um, I'm, I'm seeing situations where a mom smokes marijuana one time, but because she has history with OUD, somebody's calling DCBS and it's becoming a barrier. Uh, you know, the other things to keep in mind with it is, um, our own tendency of how we're going to view ourselves and our role in this. We need to avoid seeing this as an us and them issue. It's a, to all of us together. And I think the opioid epidemic more than anything has highlighted uh, the commonality of vulnerability for the disease of addiction. And it's really important for us to see the people in front of us as someone's mother, sister, friend, brother, husband, and when we lose sight of that and we just see them as whatever the diagnosis is, we're doing them a disservice, we're perpetuating the stigma and we're limiting their opportunity. Um, so I think it's just really mindful practice to be able to start looking at someone beyond just what they're seeking help for. Great, thank you. Sarah Johnson. Um, thank you, Jules, you did a great job and I'm gonna try to add to what you said, uh, stigma is one of the biggest barriers that I think we face in this field. Um, we see it, it's pervasive in um, on the systematic level with laws, uh, with policies, we see it in communities and even with treatment and service providers. So we talk about availability of treatment and availability of services, but what we don't talk about is accessibility. There's so many policies and restrictions placed on people that even though there's availability of these services, they can't access them because they don't fit into this little box that we've written the policies about to determine who can get those services. Um, and as a result, there is a lot of self-stigma. I mean, we talked a little bit about the MOUD and the self-stigma with that. 
people aren't seeking out treatment, they aren't being uh, engaged in recovery services because they themselves are thinking this is not the right pathway. I'm not truly clean and sober. Um, so we have to change the way that we're viewing things. Language matters. We have to be person-centered. Um, as social workers, we are trained to promote the dignity of worth, at worth of every individual. And we have to do that and set the example in all the groups that we are in. No one should be defined by the worst thing that they've ever done or that's ever happened to them. And so often, because we receive clients who are in crisis, that is what they're labeled as. They're labeled as their criminal conviction. They're labeled as their diagnosis. They're labeled as whatever trauma they have suffered through. And we have to make sure that people see them so much as so much more than that one thing that happened to them or that they did. Um, I really feel like we have to be the example. When I'm in groups and I hear people say inmate or addict, I use the correct language. And what I see is over time, people start correcting their language to mirror mine. So that's really important is to set that example. But also we need to look at like our forms and our policies. Because one of the things I realized is sometimes we don't even realize some of the stigmatizing language that we put on our own forms. So be purposeful. Wear your consumer hat. Think about if you're coming in and you're given this form and it asks you questions that are very um, not person-centered, that needs to be redone. Um, the other thing I would say is something that I feel like I'm very aware of stigma. I advocate against stigma and try to set an example of, of that person-centered language. But there are things that are going on in the media that even I don't pick up on all the time. And I'm stealing this from another presenter, but I heard this wonderful example. All the time in media, on in the newspaper, on the news, we hear about people who have um, died of a fatal overdose. And they'll give this description and they'll talk about how, you know, the person was found with a needle in their arm and drugs across the floor. And we read that and we're like, oh, man, that's so awful. You know, I hate that, that happened. But we don't question the way they reported it. Can you imagine if the media portrayed other chronic illnesses like diabetes and, and they gave this uh, media report of somebody dying of complications with their diabetes and they said McDonald's french fries were scattered across the floor and they had their hand in a pie, people would be appalled. Like why in the world would they do that to talk about somebody that has this chronic illness? But why aren't we appalled when people do it every day with the chronic illness of substance use disorder. And so what I say as social workers is we have to be appalled and we have to say, no, that is not right. And we have to set the example of how to make sure that people are seen as people with value and worth first and foremost. And then we'll talk about the things that they need to work on. Great, thank you. I think we're going to continue this thread of stigma and talking about very specific instances where it has had an impact. Um, the question is, how have you seen or observed stigma impacting individuals or families' decisions to enter treatment, treatment in general and MOUD specifically? And I'd like to ask Kay to lead this discussion and then followed by a response from Ty. Thank you. And Jules and Sarah, touched on this and did a very beautiful job um, explaining stigma. Um, but one particular area I'd like to discuss is stigma can be seen in our self-help meetings um, where members or peers in those meetings don't necessarily agree with individuals taking medication for opioid use disorder. So some of our participants have been told they're replacing one substance with another or they're using it as a crutch. So this can deter many people that are utilizing medication for opioid use disorder from attending those self-help meetings. They're not all of them, of course, but there's some. And also treatment centers that do not allow medication for opioid use disorder um, or that even offer it can deter individuals from entering treatment 
if they feel their medical decision isn't being supported. So medication for opioid use disorder is a personal decision, which we've seen can enhance the quality of our participants or clients' lives. Um, and that's the ultimate goal when treating substance use disorders. I mean, we want to allow people access to medication for opioid use disorder to help them reintegrate back into the community, regain employment, be an active member in their family or an active parent and a present parent with their children and also contribute to society. So we want to, our goal is to reduce stigma so people can feel comfortable receiving the treatment that they need and deserve. Thank you. Ty? So I've seen stigma impact um, a lot of individuals when they are trying to enter treatment, um, specifically with MOUD. Uh, they were seen as not being clean, not being in recovery, um, trading one drug for another. And as Kay touched on, especially in self-help meetings, not all self-help meetings, but it's a huge barrier when you go to seek a meeting and it gets brought up and if you have the courage to say well I'm on medication for opioid use disorder it it becomes a big deal and I think the stigma just needs we need to use person first language when it comes from the top down, because then everyone around will start using person first language. Um, I've seen stigma personally when I entered treatment and um, it almost prevented me from entering treatment. And I think back about it and I try my hardest now these days to use person first language and always be on the side of the recovery. Um, you know, when someone says they're in recovery, they are in recovery and to always be on their, be their advocate because it is so easy to slip up and slip out of recovery. And then you have so many barriers after that that can just upheave your whole life. So I, I really, um, really love this question and I think that it as everybody has touched on the stigma and just being person first is where we need to start great thank you Sarah you agreed to speak to the next two questions and so we may kind of run those together if that works well for you. So the, the questions are, could you speak to some of the policies that are related to healthcare in particular that you've witnessed that are stigmatizing? And, and so we've kind of already touched, I think, on a couple of these. And then for social work agencies in particular, how can we change those some of those policies to promote more of a stigma-free workplace? And since we touched a little bit already on the health system, again, I'll just say it's not availability, it's access. So making sure our policies and um, the criteria or admission um, requirements are in designed in a way that anyone that needs treatment can access it. Uh, part of this question also talked about some of the criminal justice involvement. And since that's really my area of expertise, I wanna talk to you a little bit more about that because um, there's some real stigma and some real challenges within the criminal justice system. So, you know, right now I work for the Department of Corrections, but I also worked for several years for the Department of Public Advocacy. I worked on the parole board. So I've had these various roles within the criminal justice system. And there's so much complexity uh, with it because, you know, part of what we see is mandates. We see specific statutes that govern what we can and we what we can't do when it comes to treatment. We see judges orders that either mandate specific intensity or levels of care or lengths of treatment or restrict access to certain things like MOUD. 
which creates some real challenges in making sure that people receive the treatment that they are um, in need of. Um, we also see that that self-help groups, um, clinicians, medical providers, there's these views that one pathway of recovery is better than others. And it's always abstinence, right? So we, we see policies that perpetuate that stigmatizing view that abstinence is the superior pathway. Um, I think what we really need to do is we make need to make sure that our policies and procedures are grounded in what the data and science says. So making sure that we are following the evidence when it comes to best practice, we need to make sure that we have policies in place to increase awareness and knowledge and that that be ongoing because um, education, I think, is the key for these changes, but it has to be something that's ongoing and purposeful, um, not just, you know, during your education, but annual training, requirements of licensure, so that you're continuously staying up to date with what the new emerging research says and being very uh, cognizant of uh, stigmatizing uh, things that your agency may be doing or that you may be saying yourself. Um, it we have to look at removing restrictions. We have to meet people where they're at. So we really need to take a view of the policies and look at who are we preventing from getting access. Um, and we need to involve our consumers. We need to have people that are receiving the services at the table telling us about what policies make it where they can't receive what they need. So we have to have that input from our clients, successful or, or not. We needed the whole spectrum of recovery um, of what do you need that you're not receiving and why can't you receive it? Or what could we do better? It has to be that continuous ongoing process and continuous review of policies to ensure that we are providing the best services we can. Thanks, Sarah. Um, we did have a question from one of the participants. Um, and it seems because we are kind of talking about policies in MOUD, maybe now's the time to insert the question. Um, should we, let's see, I lost the question. Oh, curious why drug court participants cannot be on medication for their OUD. Does anyone want to take that? Um, I will say that some counties do allow medications for opioid use disorder, Fayette being one of them. They, I think, were the pilot program um, for it. And um, I had a, I, I'll be very plain and transparent. I was in drug court, uh, Fayette drug court, and um, my judge allowing me to have uh, medications for opioid use disorder to treat my illness um, was a pivotal pivotal part of my recovery. Um, and that I think is kind of going into the rural areas and becoming more of a practice. And if I could just add, if there's any federal funding, it's mandated that they offer MOUD. Um, but if a individual drug court judge says they do not want it, then they can run a court without that funding and be able to have a drug court. But again, that goes back to those policies and procedures and uh, judges sometimes practicing medicine from the bench without some kind of clinical assessment to determine what services someone actually needs. Thank you all. So we're gonna switch gears just a little bit and talk about trauma. Um, in your experience, what role does trauma play in substance use disorders? And are there certain groups of individuals that are disproportionately affected by trauma? And I'd like to ask Amy to lead this question and then we'll follow with a response from Kay. So what, what we do know um, in, what we know, I know in, research and in the medical field and those treating um, individuals with substance use disorders. And what I know myself just having walked um, recovery journeys with many, many, I don't even probably thousands of people by now um, over the course of 20 years is that many individuals who have experienced traumatic events such as um, child abuse, 
either um, criminal and or violent attacks or assaults, um, natural disasters, combat, um, have had their life um, felt to be in danger, domestic, you know, intimate partner violence, um, that many of those individuals come to misuse substances as a way to minimize or attempt to address or, and cope with their emotional pain. Um, and in addition to that, they, some, some individuals seek misuse um, to help with things like to help cope with nightmares, negative memories or thoughts that they're having, um, disrupted sleep, guilt, shame, anxiety. Um, and we, we know that many of the women that we serve also have um, used as a means to um, escape fear and being able to stay in their situations, especially as, as children. Many of the women we serve um, came to start misusing substances as adolescents, um, and the majority of them were in response to some kind of abuse that was happening to them as, as children. Um, I think that what um, we don't always talk about is that trauma and maltreatment, particularly when we experience them in childhood, that um, they're known to affect our, our, our brain's um, plasticity, um, that it can affect the structures of our brain the, um, and lead to abnormalities that are going to affect behavior um, and cognition that can affect individuals throughout their, the course of their lifetime if they don't receive treatment. And we know that when um, you know, the brain is, when we're being rushed with cortisol and all these stress hormones, um, and we are just, we're experiencing chronic stress, multiple um, incidents of trauma, traumatic events, maltreatment, that areas of the brain that um, can become dysregulated, we might become more impulsive, we may um, take more risk, and that that leads to um, that part of just on a medical organic level of not addressing trauma um, and traumatic events happening to someone lead to misuse. But for the majority, I would say 95% of the women that we treat at our clinic all come to us with, with trauma. Um, they've either, they come to us or are, are almost always diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder. We know a lot of them um, at times have had acute stress disorders. And we have some women that have dealt with chronic toxic stress for many, many years and don't know how to um, kind of navigate that because this began for them as children. Some of the, there are all kinds of subgroups that are listed um, as vulnerable people in the world. I tried to note wh who I thought that we would most, whom we would in our country mostly encounter as being traumatized um, or subgroups that are disproportionately going to be affected by trauma. Um, so those are gonna be children. Um, it's gonna be women, pregnant women um, in particularly, are disabled individuals or individuals with um, compromised immune systems, um, migrants, refugees, uh, our elderly, those of a minority race, our, um, our indigenous people that um, are especially vulnerable, um, and it's other individuals like those that are living um, in impoverished, isolated areas um, who are poor experience federal poverty on a level um, that's substantial and our homeless population. And I think that anytime, and it's our um, LGBTQ community as well. I think it's anytime that there's a population of people that have culture, gender, sexual orientation, um, or physical and mental abilities that differ from um, the majority of that they're the majority of others that they live amongst that they're at risk disproportionately for stigma, discrimination, oppression, and psychological trauma. Great, thank you. So Kay, uh, maybe in addition to anything that you would add to that question, you also agreed to speak to the next one. So if you'd like to begin to transition, uh, what 
responding to anything extra you would add to what role trauma plays in SUD, but also what are some of the most effective interventions of treatment for uh, uh, individuals, both through the trauma pathway as well as through regular treatment resources. I'll try to merge those two as best I can. I know Amy touched on a lot of the, the same topics that I was thinking about too, um, as far as unresolved trauma leading to substance use potentially because you know of self-medicating with substances. Um, one subgroup I wanted to discuss and touch on is um, that might be disproportionately affected by trauma are parents with a history of foster care placement during their own childhood. So when our parents, their children are placed in foster care, it can trigger past trauma as well as create new trauma. Um, this experience can exasperate mental health symptoms and potentially cause our participants to continue or return to substance use or unhealthy behaviors by self-medicating. So it is challenging for our participants to have hope during that time um, for their future and also because of their past experiences. So TAP is trained to practice trauma-informed care and we try to help our participants gain access to mental health services and substance use treatment services to strengthen their resiliency. So we can discontinue the cycle of trauma um, in that particular subgroup. Another subgroup that I wanted to discuss as well is that is disproportionately affected by trauma are victims of intimate partner violence. Um, a lot of individuals that are experiencing intimate partner violence with a history or active substance use disorder will often express that their substance use disorder did not develop until they were introduced to substances by their partner. So some of our participants say they use substances to cope with the violence and the trauma they were experiencing during that relationship. So victims of intimate partner violence will often not leave their circumstances due to lack of support, treatment, shelter, or they're in fear of retaliation from their partner. So that was the part that I want to discuss with trauma. And based on my experiences, the most effective interventions for treatment of substance use disorders, I know that TAP is, plays a major role for a lot of our participants that are working a case plan, um, trying to reunify with their children or maintain their children in their care. But TAP is a strength-based program that utilizes assessments and motivational interviewing to determine treatment recommendations for our participants. So we take in consideration our participant substance use history and allow them to direct their treatment plan, as well as discuss treatment options that might work best for their circumstances. Um, what might work well for one particular individual may not work well for another. If we have a parent that has housing, that has a full-time job or employment, they have a vehicle, um, but they also have an opioid use disorder. Um, we're not going to recommend residential treatment. Um, we might not even recommend intensive outpatient, um, especially if they're working full-time hours, um, Monday through Friday, and they have other obligations in the evening as well. So we will recommend you know, medication for opioid use disorder and those types of services. So it just depends on their particular circumstance. So many of our participants struggle to identify their strengths because of their substance use history. Um, TAP tries to help parents identify their strengths and resiliency and motivate them to accomplish their goals of reunifying with their children or keeping them in their care. So once we build rapport and trust with our participants, they feel comfortable setting goals and TAP offers guidance to resources that will help them reach those personal goals. Um, we refer our participants to either residential, intensive outpatient, outpatient um, that also treat co-occurring disorders is our top priority. Uh, many of our participants report a history of mental health symptoms and self-medicating with substances. Therefore, we want to ensure that their mental health symptoms and substance use disorder are treated holistically and not just individually. Um, we address each of their barriers to help our participants receive adequate treatment and remain active in recovery. So the most effective resources that I have seen and that I have utilized in my community is um, the, the resources that offer medication for opioid use disorder, um, harm reduction, mental health services, 
peer support and case management services. And I want to highlight case management services because although TAP, I mean, we we help um, try to reduce barriers as much as we can by trying to help them navigate different resources that can help them get housing, um, food, transportation, but case management also in another organization that receiving treatment from is extremely helpful. Um, I think it takes a village to raise a child, but it also takes a village to help someone reintegrate back into society. So that's the biggest takeaway that I have from that. Great, thank you. So the next question is, can you talk a little bit about the importance of employing a person with lived experience as a professional peer in engaging families with, with substance use disorder? And I would like to ask Sarah Bryant to lead the discussion followed by response from Jules. So I think having peers uh, is an invaluable uh, tool for a resource for any agency. Um, with START, we have, we call our peers family mentors because we have, in addition to experience recovery, we want them to also have experience as a recipient of child welfare services. Um, and in my time with START, I've seen such an increased level of engagement from our clients. Um, as many folks know, DCBS has been experiencing a shortage of employees. And so our team has been helping out with investigations and often we're referred to those investigations with substance use. Um, and so our peers are, are going out and helping us with those investigations and helping families understand, you know, if if there's something that's not going to be open, you know, helping them understand what we're needing and, and increasing that engagement with families. They're also educating us every single day on what somebody may be feeling and helping give us that perspective that that client is too intimidated to share with us. Um, they really help with, you know, with that initial meeting, talking with a client about what's to be expected, what are our next steps, what are, what's that meeting going to look like, who's going to be at the table. So when that client walks to that first meeting, they kind of have an idea instead of feeling like oh, this room of social worker is about to make a decision for me again, um, we're, that we're going to partner with them. Um, and I think that they've definitely shifted for our agency. They've become a big resource for Fayette County um, DCBS. A lot of workers will stop by and ask them questions or investigative workers um, just to understand that lived experience piece that many of us don't have. Um, and so I think integrating them in every sort of agency and utilizing that peer experience um, is very valuable. Great, Jules. As somebody who's been in the field for quite a while, I would describe peer support as being the Christmas tree uh, surprise that you didn't expect Christmas morning, but then once you got it, you were like, wow, whoever knew I needed this. Um, peer support, I couldn't imagine doing my job now um, that I've had the experience of collaborating with peer support without them. Uh, the fact of the matter is they can say things from their lived experience that I can't. Um, and as a counselor, my, my perspective and my practice and, and the ethics I operate by are gonna be different, which creates opportunities for a peer support to be able to come alongside and be able to say, hey, I've been there, I've done that and look at where I am now. One of my colleagues described peer support as um, being the, the, the advertisement for what makes recovery attractive. And she would talk about how when you're watching, you know, a McDonald's commercial on, on TV, they don't show you a floppy hamburger with the lettuce sliding out and the bun smashed down. They show you this beautiful, you know, sandwich that looks amazing that you're just like, oh, wow, that's really good. Well, that's what my peer support do. They get to say, look at how good recovery can be. Um, and, and that helps create that level of hope that I can say it all, all until I'm blue in the face, but for them to be able to actually look at somebody and go, oh, wait, you were in prison too? Oh, wait, you, you use drugs intravenously? You had this issue, that issue, you were homeless, and now you have a job, and you're in recovery, and your family is interacting with you again and you have people who respect you. Like there is something about that that is just priceless. So, I mean, I could go on for hours. You obviously can tell I get a little excited about this, but um, peer support has been a game changer in our field, 100%. I completely agree with all of that positive feedback. Um, so in the interest of time, I think we're gonna 
combine a couple of questions here. I also want to direct our panelists to the chat. There may be a question there that you all could answer offline. And if we need to discuss it, we'll try to carve some time out for that. So uh, but the next question uh, speaks to some of the most valuable resources that you would recommend for children and families with SUD. And I'd like to ask Amy to address that. But then as a quick follow-up, what are some of the policies that we need to be advocating for that help families uh, dealing with substance use disorder? So Amy, if you could lead us off discussing the valuable resources and then Ty and Sarah Bryan, if you could talk more about what policies we really need to be advocating for. So no matter where I grow um, and how much I develop as a social worker, there are just gonna be some things that are always going to be um, within me, which is always going to be case management. It's always going to be connecting people with the services they need. So for this question, I wrote down um, multiple resources that I have used in helping um, in helping families and especially children that are affected by having a parent or a loved one um, in subs with a substance use disorder. So treatment wise, so this would be already, um, you know, a family that has uh, has um, someone that's actively in use. This wouldn't be the preventive me measures for children, but in that family moving forward and these children be supported, some resources that I have always found to be the most valuable are going to be mutual aid groups. So those are going to be groups like Al-Anon, Al uh, um, Adult Children of Alcoholics, um, Non and on, um, I always um, encourage families whenever, whenever possible and affordable um, to pursue some form of family counseling. If that's a grandparent raising a grandchild, them being together, um, talking about some grief and loss because we have that when we may have an individual in substance use that is not recovered. Um, a lot of children have some considerable well, I'd say all children that I've encountered that have been removed from a parent um, and live in an alternative care um, setting grieve and feel substantial loss when they are separated from their parents. So I always encourage pursuing therapy for our children when at all possible, having family members come together in family therapy to talk about um, grief and loss, but also, sometimes um, it's very, it's valuable, though it rarely happens to the level that I feel like it needs to, where the family comes together and, and talks about their, um, their functionality, because we know a lot of our patients um, that are affected with substance use disorder, there is some dysfunction in the family. So there might be enabling, there could be abuse and neglect, there could be maltreatment, there are other things that are occurring um, that the family needs to heal from in order for the individual that's in recovery to, to continue to heal and stay um, a recovered person. Um, I know SAMHSA has a, has a bunch of information out about a new campaign. It's not, it's newish. It's, I think it's been out maybe a couple of years now, but it's the, um, and this would be for, this would be more preventive, but it's the talk they can hear you or talk they hear you. So this is about talking to our children. I know we don't think that our pre-adolescents or adolescents are listening to us, but they, but they do more than you know. Um, other organizations or resources available to people that are families that are being affected, there's Faces and Voices of Recovery. So they're an advocacy group that provides support for families. I always encourage um, grandparents to reach out to grandparents raising grandchildren. They have a helpline. Um, they're... If you Google it, there's a website. Um, there's all kinds of support for our grandparents raising their, their grandbabies. Um, I utilize partnership for, um, drug, for drug free for a, a lot for resources. Um, they have some really, they have some really great things on there, especially when it comes to prevention for children. And some of the things I love the most about that, the um, partnership for a drug free um, America is that they discuss starting to change our language when children are very young about substance use. Like they, I mean, they go as young as two, where we start to talk to our children as a preventive measure about safety relating to substance use. And it might be in the very beginning, it might be something um, that 
would seem mundane and not connected to substance use. It might be talking about we take why we take a, di a daily vitamin. Um, it might become a conversation about um, medications that we keep in our, our, our medicine cabinet and safety regarding that and that we don't get into our medicine without an adult and that we have to ask and we keep a lock on it. Um, I remember my time working in foster care, I constantly had, constantly had children I'd be out with that would ask me about people smoking or vaping and having a discussion about that, um, that about the safety, but also about adults being able to make that decision, um, but still talking about the risk. So there's a lot of preventive information that starts talking about educating our children while they're young, teaching them safety um, when they're young building connections and rapport and conversations with their children and other things like setting limits, monitoring our children. Um, it has some really great information on that website and I share it all the time with our women. That's great. Amy, actually, would you mind uh, putting that website in the chat uh, for anybody in the room who might be interested in that as well? Um, I think if it's okay in the interest of time, we might go ahead and transition to the policy question. Um, Ty, if you'd be willing to lead us off, just policies that you think we need to be advocating for more strongly for families with substance use disorders. I know Sarah can speak to this more intelligently than I can, um, but I know a policy uh, that the policies that were in place when I was going through the START system um, was uh, the individualization of my specific case, um, where, as an example, I was given a certain amount of time of unsupervised visits from the very beginning. And that, so the unification of the family unit transpired to being of the foster parents as well. And so we became one family and they're still family till this day. Um, I just went to their daughter's first birthday. Um, and just that uh, ability to have that individualized plan is what we really need for our women who are experiencing substance use disorder of any kind. Um, because I didn't lose connection with my newborn twins. I had that time with them, I got to I got to spend time with the foster parents, um, and we just became one big family instead of it being a divided situation. And you know, they want my kids, and I'm trying to keep my kids, and feeling like the system was all against me. It became one big collaborative, and I think that is exactly what we need in this day and age. Thank you, Sarah. I agree, Ty. And that's a family first prevention. We need more preventative services and child welfare um, to have those unique case plans, to have workers with lower caseloads and to have more resources available for families to ensure family unification um, and that consistent contact. I also think on the criminal justice side, so STAR operates off the philosophy of we are, when families are in crisis and in crisis theory that you know, anybody who is in that crisis moment, given birth to a child and DCBS is knocking at your door, you're more likely to go to treatment. I think we need to move that over to uh, criminal justice. And instead of going to jail, we offer that pathway to treatment in that crisis moment and not the criminal charges that come along with it um, to, to create more pathways to treatment, more opportunities for people to get involved um, in services outside of the criminal justice system and outside of, of any government agency. Um, and the other piece I think we need to advocate for is expungement. You know, when folks get into recovery, oftentimes they're coming into recovery with multiple felonies that then limit access to so many resources. And, you know, there's expungement clinics, but it's still a long pathway and a process that I can't understand. So how are we gonna expect someone in early recovery or even a couple of years in recovery to understand it. So there needs to be better pathways to expungement of those past charges um, so that folks have access to resources and jobs to be sustainable um, and productive and to maintain recovery and not have those um, situations that may lead to a return to use um, or some sort of lapse. 
Great, thank you. So in the interest of time, we're gonna wrap up with one final question so that we do save some additional time at the end for questions. Um, do you have suggestions for how to educate and train social work students as they prepare for professional careers that either focus on substance use disorders directly or indirectly? Um, Sarah Johnson agreed to respond to this question, but you all have trained social work students and you all have worked uh, with, with different professionals training in that capacity. So Sarah, if you could lead us off, that'd be great. But if anybody else has any additional thoughts, feel free to chime in. Absolutely. Um, so first of all, I feel like I had a wonderful education at UK getting my master's degree. Um, so, but I looked at it as what do I wish I had been trained on when I was in um, school and what do we try to make sure students have the opportunity to experience during their practicum um, experience and training. Um, first of all, you will experience substance use disorder. So I hear people say, you know, oh, I don't want to work in that field. I don't want to work with people that are dealing with addiction. If you are a social worker, I don't care what kind of social work you do, substance use disorder will, you will be impacted by it either directly or indirectly. So you have to understand it. You have to be able to um, really know how to help people whatever that may look like in your um, agency. I feel like the biggest missing piece is hands-on experience and talking to clients that are in active use, that are in early recovery and that are in long-term recovery. Really, truly understanding what people are experiencing, hearing about the different pathways and understanding the different pathways to recovery and the experience of people who have went through those different pathways. I think it's essential that we understand and train our social workers that we can't put our standards or expectations on someone and we can't hold them to higher standards than we hold ourselves. So many of our clients are asked to do so many things and I couldn't do them myself. So it's important to make sure that we are not creating an unrealistic expectation for our clients. Um, we have to make sure that we focus on strengths and understanding that there is strengths, understanding that we may be the only person that's dealing with this individual in crisis that can say, I believe in you, you can do this. Um, we have to meet them where they're at. We may have education and training, but at the end of the day, our clients are the expert on their life. So we have to understand that whatever we bring to the table, we are able to assist the individual, but they have to drive their life and they are the expert on their own life. Um, some other things I think are important, self-care, 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 self-care. You know, no matter which field in social work that you work, there's going to be things that bad things that happen to clients and it's not your fault and things are out of your control, but you have to take care of yourself so that you can be there to assist your clients. Um, I came out of, of grad school with this, I'm going to save the world kind of mentality. And I hope people never lose that fire of trying to save the world, but understanding that you can't save every person you won't necessarily save the world, but every person that you touch has ripple effects. And those ripple effects, you can't count. Um, it's okay to say you don't know how to do something. I think sometimes we are so trained to, you know, here you do this job. Social work or, or social work is such a versatile degree that just because you have a social work degree doesn't know, mean that you know how to do everything that a social worker can do. So it's okay to say, I don't know how to do this. Um, you need to look at yourself constantly and look at how can you do better and be better. And at the end of the day, make sure that you're keeping an open mind, reading the research, using validated tools and evidence-based practices. Thank you, Sarah. Any final thoughts related to the importance of, of making some, uh, imp having implications for social work training or practice? Okay. 
I know we've had a few questions in the chat. Uh, our panelists have been responding as we have uh, been going along. Uh, I think, uh, Lisa, I may turn it back over to you at this point. I will say that we did have several questions that were submitted uh, during the registration process. Unfortunately, I think we're just running out of time. We're not gonna be able to get to those, but uh, Lisa, if you could forward those out to the panelists, we can make sure that uh, they at least have a chance to respond to those uh, with the person who submitted them. Absolutely, I will do that. And for those of you that have questions in the chat that went unanswered today, I will send them out to our panelists so that you get your questions answered. We so appreciate you being here today. And a big thank you to all of our panelists today. You did an awesome job answering these questions and really providing a lot of helpful information and tools. And a big shout out to Michelle for running this and moderating this session. You did a great job, so thank you. So I'm gonna um, just give you some information here on how to um, obtain your CE credits. Let me get share screen here. 